Avalon Cablevision proudly presents for its fourth consecutive season, Sports Personalities. And now here's your host, Ted Patey. Oh, good evening and welcome to our fourth annual Christmas Sports Personality Special and have we got a good one for you tonight. We have a fine array of athletes who were great sports people in the past and Dewey, welcome back as co-host for also your fourth season and good to see you again. Well, Ted, it's nice to be here and we certainly do have a tremendous uh, array of talent and uh, some of the finest athletes that uh, not only grace uh, the St. John's athletic community, but uh, the province in the whole, both male and female. Uh, we have athletes from uh, just about every every sport imaginable. We have uh, administrators as well as athletes, and uh, we have a few university professors thrown in. So all in all, it should be a great night, and I think you're going to start with Jack Rarity tonight. Well, do we? Let's tell the folks, uh, first off, this is going to be something different. We're going to look at the humorous side of sports, and I'll tell you, this is going to be something else once we get the people started coming in here. I'd like to say Jack Rarity is here alongside of me now, and Jack is going to start off with a little some humorous story that happened to him during his career, and Jack, welcome aboard. Thank you, Ted and Dewey. I remember uh, in my days of refereeing, one particular night I was down in the stadium and one section of the, the rink, they were really giving me a pretty hard time of it. And every time I pass by, they swear on me and, you know, the re remarks, and they say, Reardon reared this and Reardon that. So after the, the first period, I went over to this certain section and I said, look, I don't mind you abusing me, but at least try and get my name right. I said, it's not Reardon, it's Reardigan. And one fellow up in the back said, never mind, Jack, he said, that's a fellow we're training. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Dewey, that was Jack Reardigan, and or was it Reardon? And of course, Jack always defines that you have a man in sports and man on many Hall of Fames, and uh, I guess Jack can relate a good many funny stories to us. Well, Ted, Jack uh, just got uh elected to the uh, Newfoundland Sports Hall of Fame and uh, we have other people here tonight that are in that category and uh, as well only a couple of weeks ago Jack was elected to the first St. John's Regatta Committee Hall of Fame, a tremendous oarsman in these days as well. Right now you have a tremendous athlete as well in the female category, Pamela yetman Babstock. So you want to say hello to Pam there? Hi Pam, how are you? And of course talking about Pam and talking about Hall of Fames. Pam is also in the softball hall of fame and Pam I think you have a little story for us too. Yes, uh, first of all I would like to say thank you for the invitation to be on your show tonight. Being a competitive athlete I really had to dig deep into my memories to try and come up with something that's humorous. I think you need to be an official to have the humorous stories but uh, I think I'm going to have to go back to my softball days and uh, choose a time in my life when I was perhaps, uh, I believe, almost eight months pregnant at the time. But being a die-hard athlete, there was no way I wanted to pull myself off the softball diamond as such. So um, I was playing in the ladies' league in Wedgwood Park. And as I, I stated, I was eight months pregnant, so I looked quite cute up at, up at the plate. And I think this is why I decided to hit the ball long and hard each time I got up to the bat afterwards, because... Being eight months pregnant, I really had to hit that ball as far as possible in order to get myself around the bases, because they weren't having any pity on me. They wanted me to run the bases or waddle the bases. So uh, at that point in my life, being eight months pregnant, I did hit the ball, and for some reason or other, I managed to stumble around the bases. Your center of balance is really thrown off. Um, that's, that's one real quick one, but I think the one that stands out the most playing in Wedgwood Park was the year I played with the men's league. At that time, uh, I think I was the only female catcher in the men's league around, and we had invited uh, Puchkov up for an exhibition game. And I guess the Puchkov guys hadn't had a chance to kind of sum up what the other dugout looked like, and, and they hadn't seen that there was a female over there. And uh, it was just in the first inning, and we had a a runner from Pooch Cove coming in from third base. And uh, the pickoff play had come into home plate. And of course, being the good catcher, I'd whipped off the mask and faced this guy as he was barreling down from third to home. And I, I looked at him, he looked at me, and he realized I was female, and he stopped dead in his tracks. And with that, I just gently put out the glove, tagged him, said thank you, and that was it. <laughs> 
Well, Pam, thanks for joining us tonight on our Christmas sports special. What a pleasure. You're very welcome. Of course, always a great story come from the, the female sports athletes because uh, they've been in, involved in numerous tournaments, Dewey, and of course, always something funny happening. And Dewey, I don't know who we got coming in next year. We got all those athletes out there and nobody wants to come in. Look at this. We, we have one of the fondest baseball players that not only uh, Newfoundland ever produced, but I would say an amateur ball that Canada ever produced, Gordon Brain. Gordon is on his way up here and now another Hall of Famer. Of course, Mr. Baseball. Mr. Baseball, and course, Gordon. Brain. Gordon has always got a good story for us, not only here for a Christmas special. Anytime you meet Gordon, uh, he's got a story for you. And Gordon, uh, welcome aboard. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Good to be here. And I understand you have a little story for our sports show. Oh, uh, if I think back over the years, the many years I've been around in sports, I guess I'd have a lot of, a lot of uh, funny stories. You wouldn't have time to tell them all. But probably the, some of the funniest instances I ever saw was uh, the year that we played with the old-timers team up in uh, Wishing Well Park. And every time uh, Robin Short went after a, a foul pop, or a pop-up, uh, pop as we call them, uh, that was a comical incident, incident right there because uh, he usually missed it by five or ten feet and then he'd usually draw a laugh from all the boys. But I'd have to go back, uh, like Pam, I'd have to go back uh, quite a few years to uh, come up with some of the funnier instances back in the old days when uh, things weren't so good for the ball players and the, the equipment wasn't so good and so on like that. But I remember... Uh, in the Goss League in Victoria Park when I was a young boy. Uh, Dewey will remember this one also, that uh, we, we would have an occasional game of scrap baseball up there. And uh, you, could see, you could see anything on a given day up there. And I remember in one particular game, we were just having a scrap game, and one of our, one of our outfielders, Jack St. George, uh, people in the West End might remember Victoria Park in them days, the swimming pool at the rear of the, uh, at the park. And uh, there was a long fly ball hit out in the outfield. And Jack, the, in his enthusiasm, and uh, people were really enthusiastic about the game in them days, Jack took a flying dive into the swimming pool and managed to uh, hold what would have been a home run to a double. So that was probably uh, one of my favorite amusing incidents. Okay, Gordon, thanks for joining us on this Christmas sports special. It's always a pleasure talking to you. You too, Ted. Thanks, thanks Gordy. And, of course, uh, Dewey, uh, I think next in line here to come in, we have uh, one of the all-time great pitchers uh, in baseball with St. Bonds and the St. John's Capitals. And uh, I think uh, that athlete, his name is uh, Jed Gambert. And uh, I think Jed is going to get ready to, uh, to come in here now. And, uh, Jed, you want to join us here? Well, Jed had a great career. Not only did Jed uh, play with the bands and with the St. John's Capitals, Jed also pitched in the corner rope, and few people don't realize this, but uh, Jed Gamberg was one of the first ball players, if not one of the first pitchers to ever pitch off to the Islands when he pitched down in uh, Kentville with the Wildcats. The Kentville Wildcats in the H&D League. Probably what, in uh, around 57, 58, Jed? Yeah. Well, well, I remember one uh, incident, uh, Jeb was playing in Corner Brook. I think Charlie Ince, one great hitter, was up at the plate, and Jeb uh, fired a fastball. And I think uh, you got to hit the line drive, didn't you, Jed? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure, Jed. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Did you ever get over that one, Jed? <laughs> <laughs> now you have some funny story to tell us, I'm sure. Jed, tell them about the Duke of the, the Duke of the Ball. Duke of the Ball? Yeah. Yeah, one time we were playing Grand Falls, and I struck out uh, Dick Duder, see? And Mike Martin came over and he said, uh, why did you pitch to him? I said, the first one was a curve, the second one was a knuckleball, and the third one was a dukebore ball. And Mike said, what's a dukebore ball? I said, oh, that's a new pitch i got to get nothing out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, you, you, you've had a, had a tremendous career, and, and, and uh, you've had a lot, an awful lot of highlights, but you've had a, a lot of humorous uh, events as well. Do you, do you want to touch on a couple for us? I suppose the one that um, I guess blamed for most of all is the uh, time we were playing the Americans and the bases were loaded. Or no, there was only two on. And uh, Dee Donnelly was a coach, and he... Their main hitter was up, their clean-up batter was up. He had played triple-A ball up in the States and that. And um, D gave me the signal to put him on. And so I didn't figure I should deprive the poor guy of not pitching a batting against me. So <laughs> instead of lobbing him in, 
I lobbed one right down the middle, right down Broadway. Buddy whacked into it and hit it for a tripping. And he came out of the dugout, boy, he was so mad. He said, I thought I told you to put him on. I said, yeah, I put him on, he's over and third. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jed, thanks for joining us tonight on the Christmas Sports Festival. Okay, it was a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> I don't think Jed ever got over that line drive, uh, Joey. And uh, what I want to mention here was uh, one I heard about yourself was uh, in the early days of softball. I think you were umpire in chief, and uh, some community outside of St. John's there was a softball game going on, and two runners ended up on third base. And three. Three runners ended up on third base. And of course, there was a big controversy. And uh, finally, you were the umpire in chief. They send you off a telegram saying, "Mr. Fitzgerald, we had three players on the one base." He said. What, what can he asked for a ruling. That's what it was. What we were going to do. He said, what would you do with if three runners ended up on third at one time? And I said, fire the coach. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right tonight on. now we have Tolson Chapman. And of course, uh, one of the premier athletes that, uh, that this province has ever produced. Names the sport. Chappy was a star. Tolson, nice to have you board. Nice to be here, Dewey. Can you add a little bit more? And told I'm sure, sure there's some funny incident that happened in your career. So you want to tell us one? Yeah, sure. I selected a baseball one also. For some reason, baseball seems to have the, the most funny funny stories, and uh, there'll be three or four more characters come on after me who will also tell a baseball story, I'm sure. But when I was with uh, Davy Hall, who was pitching for the Felians, and Birchie Wedgwood was, was catching, and Davy was having a, a bad game. He was getting hit pretty hard. And Birchie, being a good catcher, said, well, I better go out and, and talk to Davy." So he goes out to the mound and says, Davy, take it easy. You know, your, your fastball is not working. Your curve is not working. Your drop is not working. You know, just get serious now. We're getting, we're getting hit pretty hard here. And uh, Birchie turned around to go back behind home plate. And just as he did, Davy gave him a slog, you know where, and said, <laughs> if you don't tell me how to pitch, you go back there and catch. I remember that night when... Okay, Thomas, thanks for joining us tonight. Bye. You know, Ted, uh, we, we have uh, quite an array of talent tonight, and uh, we've already talked uh, to Pam Babstock, and on our way up now we have uh, Mary Taylor, of course, in, in our heyday in athletics here. She was Mary Wakeham, a uh, great volleyball player, great basketball player, and uh, softball as well, and went down to, to start at Acadia University. So, Mary, it's nice for you to be with us. Thank you, Welcome Dewey. Forward, Mary. Thanks, Ted. I guess you have some funny incident that happened during your career, Mary. Well, basically, the rule of thumb is that when you're on a road trip, you just don't bring anything home. You just leave it where it is, all the stories stay. But one of the things <clears throat> I would like to relate to, uh, to everybody is uh, a story of national basketball. Uh, and we were sitting there at a, at a reception, a buffet, basically. And they decided that they were going to start uh, with BC, and they were going to come up and they were going to uh, go through the buffet line, and they'd work their way down, and eventually the last province would be Newfoundland. Being to these tournaments before and being at this type of event, uh, I decided that we should get up there pretty early. We should go on up and, uh, and serve ourselves and sort of mingle in with the crowd and pretend we were from another province. So all the teammates decided that they didn't want to do that because the etiquette wouldn't allow that. And I said, well, girls, you're going to be left behind. So we all sat down for a while, and I decided, well, what the hell, let's do it. So they still wouldn't do it. So I went up, served myself, came down, had my meal, back in bed. Girls come back later. They forgot us. They forgot we were from Newfoundland. They forgot Newfoundland completely, and uh, basically they had to be reminded. And when they did managed to get up to get the buffet. There's nothing left. <laughs> Must have been a hungry trip, Mary. <laughs> for some people. <laughs> well, Mary, thanks for joining us tonight on the Christmas Sports Specials. Certainly a pleasure to have you aboard. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Mary. You know, Ted, when, when we talk about uh, Mary's basketball ability in, in the university circuit, uh, we're, we're pleased tonight that, uh, that we have with us uh, the only Newfoundlander that uh, was president of the Canadian Basketball Association. A great basketball player in his own right. He always likes to say that he played with the guards, you know. But his best basketball days were at Holy Cross. He won't admit that, but they were. That's Frank Butler. That's good. Frank's stepping in here right now. Frank, welcome aboard. It's a pleasure to be here, good Ted. To see you again, Frank. I'm sure you have some story to tell us. Well, uh, over my career, I guess I can uh, relate to uh, a lot of them from coaching perspective. 
from an administrator's perspective and, and of course, a player's perspective. I'll try one short one from each, if I may. I guess one of the first times uh, a group of Newfoundland athletes that went away in basketball was prior to the Canada Games in 1967, and the late Ed Brown was the coach at that time, and he set us up with an exhibition game with the team called Ivan Catou from, from Montreal. Well, we go back a few years, there were a number of athletes who played with the Montreal Alouettes played with that team at the time. And they were primarily large, tall, big type fellows. It was a tip off at the very beginning of the game and uh, for some unknown reason, the ball went to John Emberley, who played with the university team at the time and uh, he scored the first basket. And uh, it's, it, from that point on, during the game, I don't think he saw the basketball thereafter. And uh, we found that I found that quite humorous because uh, we're always uh, John was a short fellow and I was standing at six one, and these fellows were about six eight and six ten. Another story that uh, I can relate to is from an administrative perspective is having been a chef de mission for Canada Games in 1973 in Burnaby, New Westminster. It was a great pleasure at that time to be able to stick to the rules of the game. And one of the rules of the game at that time, when athletes and players uh, and coaches and managers were at these games, they, they were confined to, uh, to a headquarters or athlete's village. And it was a pleasure at that time to not let Dee Murphy sleep with his wife uh, at those games. And uh, that created a, a, a stir. And I can hear Dewey laugh, and I know he re can relate to it. But it was, I had the best laugh out of that one in the long run, because I know he cheated on me. <laughs> so I can go on and on with a lot of stories, but I know you have other very important guests there. Okay, Frank, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. And of course, coming in right now, we have Donnie Yepman, and uh, Donnie, great athlete uh, in his day, and I'm sure Donnie has a story for us also. So Donnie, you just go right ahead, boy, and tell us your story. I can't do it. Well, nice to actually, see you, Don. You know, Charlie Riddle always says that the knees up, you were the best ball player in the country, <laughs> but he said he got no knees. That's for sure. That's for sure. Actually, I can, uh, I like Tolls can probably relate uh, more funny stories to uh, the involvement that I had in baseball. I think in hockey we had a lot of funny stories, but they were 18 to 2 losses to St. Bonds and uh, 17 to 3 uh, to the guards. And they're funny stories to some people, but not so funny to us. But I can recall over the past summer, my, my story will relate to just this past summer when uh, I played some old timers baseball with some of the fellows here in St. John's. And we happened to go to uh, Port of Port to play in an old timers baseball tournament. And we had fellows on that trip like uh, Robin Short and Ronnie Butler. And I think if most of you people know them, you have to realize that whenever they're involved in a team, you have to be careful because you never know what the heck they're going to do. We also had some fellows who take uh, the old timers baseball tournaments who, where it's supposed to be fairly fun filled, a little bit serious. So we had a situation where we were into the championship game against Port of Port. And we had one of the fellows who was with us, uh, C.P. Williams. And he was uh, an American chap from down Louisiana, Louisiana way. And he had, he always, every time he went at bat, he took a vicious swing at the ball. So I think it was probably the second or third inning, the score was two to two. CP was at bat and we had a runner on base. And Robin happened to come to me and say, just watch this, this is gonna be good. So anyway, the time was called and uh, they talked to the umpire to get the uh, distraction away from the pitcher. I happened to notice that one of our fellows happened to go out to the pitcher on the mound. The next thing we knew, uh, the pitcher wound up and threw uh, just a lob ball, and CP took an absolutely vicious swing at the ball, and what a whack, what a crack. The, the ball smashed in smithereens, and I found out that, Robert, that uh, Robin had painted a grapefruit <laughs> and threw it, and the ball just smashed. And if you had seen the look on CP's face at that time, it was fascinating. I'm sure it was. Well, Daddy, thanks for joining us. Okay, Ted, thank, thank you. you. Of course, I think I'm going to step in with us now, Dewey, is Pat Hurley, and uh, come on down, Pat. Boy, you pet rest well tonight, huh? He sure is. I'm telling you, he's like Whitey Ford going to the Hall of Fame banquet. I got a loan of that off Robin before I came. <laughs> pet, you're looking well. Nice to see you. Thanks, Billy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Daddy, Pat. Go ahead, uh, uh, Pat. Tell us some uh, funny incident that happened to you. Well, I know. After about 37 years and 30 on the road, I suppose I could tell a <laughs> few, but I wouldn't be able to tell them on TV. But uh, Dewey was involved in this one as an umpire. I think it was 62 or 63. And Johnny Wyckoff was pitching in Grand Falls, and he was about the best that I ever saw in, in Newfoundland. He was only about 18 or 19 years old. And I think in the first game, uh, he struck out 19 caps. So anyway, during that, I don't know if it was during that game or the next game, Doug Squires, who was living in, in Gander at the time, uh, was catching for Grand Falls. 
and he couldn't hold on to his fastball. And the grandfather's coach, I don't want to say his name, it may embarrass him, but uh, <coughs> the grandfather's coach uh, called to him, Dewey was umpire in chief, and Dewey said, okay, what do you want? Hurry on, he said, it's beginning to get dark, right? And this guy said, Mr. Umpire, I want to take the right fielder and move him behind the catcher. And as, I mean, anybody that knows anything about baseball knows that the catcher's the only guy that's allowed to play in uh, foul territory. And uh, <laughs> maybe Dewey can tell you what he told him, but uh, I thought that was the funniest instance that I saw for a long while, you know. I got a few more, but I mean, I, I don't think I should, should tell him I might embarrass Robin, you know. <laughs> okay, well, Robin's coming on right next now, Pat. And I'm sure Robin's going to have to say something about Pat Hurley. Pat, yeah, thanks, thanks Ted, and Merry time. Christmas to you and, do, and you, do, Dewey. And you and your family. Yeah. Same to you, Pat. Who should be coming in now, Dewey, but uh, Robin Short, uh, the storyteller of all storytellers. I'm sure he has some great ones for us. Welcome aboard, Robin. Robin is the slowest and sanest in John's of Wall Street he's ever going to see. <laughs> nice to follow the order of our players, they pass. <laughs> nice to see Dewey, a former president of the Gas League. <laughs> but in the meantime, um, like you said, there's quite a few stories to be told, but I guess the one that stands out in my mind was I think in the late 50s or early 60s, we played non Newfoundland baseball tournament in Grand Falls. And um, I went to the game early, like a few of us would do, to get a, try to get in shape. And um, usually there's about 10 or 20 people at the uh, start of a ball game. But on this particular day, there must have been about 100 or 200. And of course, I walked into the ballpark feeling great, and then all of a sudden, uh, as the saying goes, I started. I think there was cans coming at me, rocks coming at me, and everybody were uh, bawling out and shouting at me and swearing at me, and I didn't know what was going on. So, of course, throughout the game, it uh, continuously happened that every time I came to bat or every time I made a play at, at, uh, on the field, uh, the fans were really giving me a hard time. So, of course, after the game, I, along with a couple of the ball players, found out what happened. It was this fella by the name of Ron Butler who got on open line, and uh, before the game started, he, poor Mark Roberts, or Mike Roberts, I think he's dead now, he was the, the open line host. Ron told him, uh, disguising his voice, letting on he was me, that as far as the, the field was, is concerned, in Grand Falls with nothing but gopher holes and half of the fans should be locked up in the mental hospital and uh, everybody out around Grand Falls were nuts and it was only a waste of time for St. John's to go to Grand Falls to play now at Newfoundland because it's only a matter of how many runs we were going to win it by. So anyway, that's what happened. He got me good. He let on. He was me talking about the team and the field. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, Robin, thanks for joining us tonight and have a good Christmas. Well, and I'm sure some of the fellows are coming in now. We're just waiting for you to get up here first <laughs> so they can come in after and have their say. I'm sure they have a lot to say. Thanks, Robin. You know, Ted, we've talked about baseball and hockey and basketball, you know, and uh, now we're going to talk to a fellow who covers them all. One of your hosts here at Cable Television and Good Sports, Fred Jackson. Sports editor of the Evening Telegram. Sports editor of the Evening Telegram. Freddie, welcome aboard. And Freddie, I'm sure all you've been involved in the, the higher levels, minor uh, softball, so you've been involved with hockey. You've written about it all. I'm sure you have uh, some story to tell us. Yeah, some are unprintable and actually didn't reach a paper. <laughs> but the big one was when I was about 17, 18 years old, uh, breaking into coaching ranks at higher levels, and Robin Short was our senior mentor, and he always emphasized uh, discipline. And uh, he said, now, Fred, look, he said, you're starting out young, he said. The only young boy said, look, he said, I want discipline. He said, nobody drinks on the road. They're in bed by 10 and whatnot. So we went to Grand Falls to the All Newfoundland uh, Junior A Championship. And Dewey was the umpire in chief of that tournament. It was in 1981. And uh, so the boys were in bed at 10 o'clock. So we were over to Mount Payton and I had them a few nightcaps. And we came back and Robin said, gee, Fred, look, he said, look, 40 years old, he said, to all in bed, not a sound, not a sound. So anyway, I happened to, my wife was with me on the road and uh, I couldn't get in my room at the time. She was asleep and I said, something Robin had to use the wife's room. We used one of the boys' wife's room. And sure enough, some were in bed and some were half drunk. And uh, I was wondering why. And Robin said, Freddie, where, get the, where did they get the beer? So I had to go and use the wife's room and the, uh, and the uh, toilet was filled up with ice, the flesh box. And he said, look, he said, see the discipline? 
<laughs> so now we know where the beer is all headed. Yes, it was in the uh, toilet. Freddie, thanks for joining us Thank tonight. You. And it's a real pleasure talking to you again. Okay, Freddie. Who we have next here, do we? Well, next, of course, we have the referee chief of the Newfoundland Amateur Hockey Association. Mr. Ray Mr. Ball. Mr. Ray Ball. Is there any such thing as the Newfoundland Amateur Hockey Association? Not anymore. It probably was one time. We won't was... ask Ray that. We'll talk to him about when he played with the unicorns. Right now, Newfoundland hockey is semi-pro, I would say. Ray, welcome aboard, buddy. Thank you, Ted. Do we? And I'm sure you have some story for us related to probably hockey as a referee. Well, I like we go into hockey or softball, but uh, I think I should take my story, seeing that I spent most of my time away from Newfoundland, back to the days I started up refereeing junior hockey in the West Coast. I was doing a game one night in Seattle, Washington, between Seattle and uh, the Langley Lords out of BC. Now, the Langley Lords had a bright green uniform. And at that, the first year in the league, they were known as the Chickens. So now, if anybody's been to Cornerbrook or Gander or Clarenville to see what's thrown on the ice in the hockey game, they should be in the stadium that night. Uh, I was halfway through the first period, and all of a sudden, over my head comes flying this big, brilliant green chicken, just a squawking. Now, if you think it's funny to watch two linesmen break up a fight on the ice or a wrestle with players, when I blew the whistle and told the linesmen to get that chicken, all the main broke loose. Everything just broke loose in the arena. There was laughter, there was screaming, there was hands on the ice. So we finally restored order. When we uh, finally got restored back to the game again, I went by the penalty box. The next thing I knew, I had a sack pulled right over my head. I found out after it was a sack that they bought the chicken in the arena with. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ray, thanks for joining us tonight on the Christmas Sports Festival. It's always a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Ray. And who do we, who we got? One of the great basketball players? Well, Glenn Taylor, a Cadia star before he came down here. You know, you know, uh, you remember a fellow played hockey down here at Dan Wells? Yes. Well, uh, besides coaching hockey at Acadia, now uh, Dan has seen uh, one of the top administration uh, phones up there at Acadia. And uh, Glenn was just up there, I think, a couple of weeks ago for come home here. So, Glenn, welcome. Yeah. Uh it was nice to see you fellas again. It's been a while, but uh, Murray and I went off for a, a weekend alumni weekend, but uh, just a chance to get away. It's been 12 years since we were back, but uh, I was trying to actually talk with Mary. I was trying to think of one of the, the funniest things that I, I've seen since, and I think it goes back to the first year that I came here. And uh, those who know me will understand, uh, Frank knows I'm well, well assured that uh, when I came here, everybody thought I was from Nova Scotia. And the funny thing was, when I spent four years in Nova Scotia, they all thought I was from the States. And the truth be known, I'm outside West End of Toronto. But, but anyways, uh, I came here, and, and uh, the uh, late Ed Brown more or less encouraged me to, to come to Newfoundland, go to university. And, and once I got here, I uh, came in tech with uh, Frank. And at that time, Frank was coaching the varsity team at Memorial, and, and I helped out as part of the graduate program. So uh, I think the funniest thing, that if I think back over the years, uh, uh, I know Tony will forgive me, this uh, Tony Wakeham. We were on a road trip, and uh, one of the things I vowed when I left the cage, I shot my mouth off. I said I'd come back and we'd, we'd uh, kick her rear end. So here we are, Frank and I, you know, a year earlier, I'm cheered, and now Frank and I walk in with the memorial team and we're booed like crazy. The place going nuts. And uh, I know for our kids at that time, uh, to see 4,000 fans in the bleachers blew them away. So here we were, we're, we're doing our best, and for the, we stayed with him for about the first two minutes. And uh, the young fella, Tony, the big fellow, we were uh, talking to Tony on the bench. I said, now, Tony, when you go out there, play tough D, do whatever you can. So I had him all psyched up, ready to go out and kill, right? So he walks out, and he goes over, reports over to the scorer's bench, and uh, the horn blows, and, and Tony goes to run out. And I say, Tony, take off your sweats. They just took out a sweatsuit on him. So he hauls the drawers down, down come his shorts, jock, everything. And he's standing there with his birthday suit hanging out. <laughs> and the fans gave him a nice applause at the true Newfoundlander he was. <laughs> but I think that uh, that's about one of, one of the funny. I mean, you can sit here all day and, and tell stories. <laughs> if not a true Newfoundlander, <laughs> certainly a fair Newfoundlander. <laughs> he showed himself, anyway. <laughs> Glenn, thanks for joining us on the Christmas Sports Festival. Real pleasure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dewey, one of the, one, not a, another all-time great baseball pitcher, Ronnie Butler, and of course, Ronnie was one of the fast pitchers, and I'm sure that when Ronnie comes on stream, there's gonna, we're going to hear some talk about some good stories, Robin Short, you name him. Just listen to this. No, he, wasn't that, he, wasn't that far, he wasn't that fast, it's just that when, when, when Ron pitched, the, the, the bats were so heavy, fellas couldn't get around. <laughs> <laughs> it was a problem. 
Hi, Ronnie. How are you? Not bad, I'm sure you have a funny story for us. Well, everybody seems to be going back to the old story of uh, the water days. Because when we first started to travel, it was by train. And everybody had a pan of water, a bucket of water in the train. By the time she got to the grandfather's corner book, she was empty. But uh, I guess the one I remember the best, and I taught before, was uh, Robin and uh, Pat Hurdy and Junior Romsey were about three years trying to get me back for something that happened a couple of years before that. So uh, they, were inter they were interviewing somebody, or somebody was interviewing them in the Holiday Inns in Cornerbrook one summer, we playing against Cornerbrook. And uh, I noticed that they uh, had something planned, and I got tipped off. So I was staying in the room with Junior Rumsey and Dave Dowden, I think. So I went up, and I put on my trunks, and all Junior Rumsey's clothes. His, uh, his socks, his shoes, his slacks, his sports coat, shirt, and tie. And I came down, and I just walked out by the back of the Holly Inns and Cornerbrook and looked around, and I saw Robin and Junior singing out to me. And I kind of made out I was running away from them, and they finally caught up with me, and Robin grabbed me, you know how big and strong Robin is, of course. He had one side of me, and Junior and Pat heard him had the other side. And they said, we got him now, let's give it to him. So they went, one, two, three, four, right in the pool. So I got in the pool and went down a couple of times. I wasn't a good swimmer or anything. So I came up and I started taking the jacket off and the shirt and tie. And I said, Junior, this is your clothes. <laughs> yeah, I can see the look on Junior's face now. He wasn't too happy about that. Ron, thanks for joining us tonight. No problem. By the way, uh, tomorrow is Robin's 60th birthday. I heard that. Congrats to mm -hmm. Yeah, we will do. <laughs> Of course, that was Ronnie Butler. The always just great. And next, uh, I see a Moose Moores out there. We'll get Moose to mosey on in here now. I'm sure Moose has uh, a lot of stories. A great softball player. Moose played a lot of baseball also. And Moose, welcome to board. Thank you. I'm calling him Moose. That was his nickname, Moose. But Wayne Moore, it's Wayne. I'm sure you got a funny story for us. Yes, it happened, I suppose, about three or four years ago, playing softball in, the, in Churchill Park. And uh, it was after, it was a Saturday morning game. I don't know if Dewey remembers this, but after Friday nights, you're not too too well after, you know, being downtown. So we're playing the game, and there was a, a pop-up behind home plate. So usually what the catcher would do, take off the mask, throw the mask away, and, and catch the ball, right? But that morning, I was a bit a bit sick, and I took off, uh, took off the mask, but I threw away the glove. And here I was, I still had the mask in my hand, trying to catch, uh, trying to catch a ball, right? And the guys who were there in the ballpark that morning, I got a bit of a razz out of that, I tell you. I, I can imagine you did, Wayne. Wayne, thanks for joining us on the Christmas Sports Special. Always a pleasure to see you. Right, thank thanks, you. Wayne. Do it. Who we have next here, do we? We got one of the fastest Newfoundlanders that ever ran. They talk about uh, Jerry Halley. This fellow never lost a race in seven or eight years. Snowy car was unbelievable. Come on up, Dave. Is he running up here now? Dave Carroll can walk. As fast as a lot of fellas can run. That's right. Thank you, Dewey. You're a gentleman. <laughs> I guess I got a couple of track and field stories. In 62, Gander opened her track. So they had, first time ever, they had their track meet. So we got into Gander, and Saturday morning we had the heats for the 220. And I think I ran about a 21.7, which was unheard of. And all the old guys were going around saying, Olympic talent, boy, you got to go to the Olympics. Somebody finally got some sense, and they measured the track, and it was 15 yards short. <laughs> <laughs> and another story Jim Emberley on Bell Island this was in 61 the AAU championships in the finals Emberley was flying had the lead he had Gatterall beaten he had Durham Connolly he was way out front and he lost his shorts needless to say losing he lost the race but not only that the evening teller him a chap croak I believe his name was, was got the picture of it so I'd say Emberley is still trying to bribe her to get that picture back <laughs> <laughs> well Dave thanks for joining us tonight and Dewey, I think we're going to take a, a short break here now, and we'll be back in just a moment. That was a real nice Christmas message, Dewey, and uh, welcome back again, folks. Uh, we just took a, a little uh, break there because we had a lull in the action, and we're back again, Dewey. And so far, we've had uh, some great athletes uh, come aboard and tell some funny stories. We certainly did. Uh, basically, the, the crime of the cr crop, the cream of the crop, actually, in, in the St. John's area. In some cases, the crime of the crop, too, let me tell you, because those fellas can really, really spin some out. And a lot of ones that they could tell, they certainly didn't. But uh, it was nice of them to come along, and I'm sure that uh, that the viewers appreciated it, and so did uh, 
sorted we, and uh, not only that, a lot of them tonight here in, uh, in Cabin Lawn Studios uh, got together, and uh, some of them haven't seen each other for quite some time, and uh, joined the show, and uh, after it, uh, they got together as we, we had our break, and, and, and uh, talked about all times, and... Uh, I remember, uh, well, I don't remember, I should remember, it just happened a half hour ago, but before the start of the show, uh, there was about 12 or 14 gentlemen, uh, the sports athletes that we're talking about, out in the, the hallway or in the lobby. And if we had a camera out there, then we could have shot a full hour because some of the stories were going around, some that you couldn't put on TV probably, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of laughing going on out there, do we? And not only in the, in the male area, we had uh, Pam Babstock and, and, and Mary Taylor, and uh, now we have uh, Colleen Tapper is going to, to join us, uh, a like former from John's Athlete of the Year, and uh, a tremendous athlete in in many sports, uh, some people look at uh, Colleen Tapper as just a, a softball person, but a uh, tremendous field hockey player, a, a basketballer of note, not, not a star basketball player, but certainly a, a better than average basketball player and uh, a tremendous all-around athlete. And, uh, you know, uh, Colleen uh, just finished up uh, a short time ago, one of, the, one of the prime organizers of the Olympic torch run in, in, in the province. And uh, that must have been a tremendous experience as, uh, as one can, can fully realize. Uh, I know that I, I went out and looked at uh, looked at the run myself, and uh, I saw the uh, opening on television. I, I know Ferd Hayward personally, he's, a, he's an old West Ender. He comes from God's Little Acres up there in the West End uh, that, uh, that we all love and like so much. And uh, Barbara and Scott King was there. And uh, people my age, of course, can remember Barbara and Scott in uh, 19... 54 when she came down and uh, laid the cornerstone of the stadium. Now some people get confused here. She wasn't there for the opening of the stadium. What she did is that she came in, laid the cornerstone, and uh, the stadium, of course, was built after, and then the cornerstone uh, put in place. And uh, of course, Barbara and Scott was uh, the Olympic gold medalist at the 1948 Olympics that were held in uh, Switzerland. And Dewey, as you mentioned, uh, Colleen uh, had a big involvement in the, the torch uh, parade and so forth. Maybe uh, Colleen can just uh, tell us a little bit about it, uh, Colleen. Uh, basically, my job was, I during the break, I, I smiled to myself as being said, uh, his definition of a consultant was a, a mainlander with a briefcase because I was classified as a community consultant for, uh, for that period of time. And uh, I would go into the community and... Um, basically pushed the Celebration 88 program, which is the Government of Canada sponsored thing, where the uh, six really very nice medals were made available to the communities. And then also uh, got involved with the Petro Canada and, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, sort of helping out answering questions or trying to get questions answered while communities were trying to organize their ceremony for the torch run. And Colleen, as Dewey mentioned, you had a, you still have a great career in sports, and uh, and I'm sure during your career you've come across some amusing incidents, and uh, probably you can tell us a couple. Uh, yes, many amusing incidents. Um, some, unfortunately, I can't tell, but uh, there were a lot of those tonight that we couldn't. Tell. I would imagine, looking at the names that you have there, with Glenn Taylor and and. Uh, Mary Taylor. Robin Short and Mary Taylor and those guys, I would say there's a lot of stories not For to sure. be told. But, uh, oh, there's lots of, of amusing stories. Um, well, Mary Taylor is involved in, in one that I always get a kick out of retelling. As, uh, she coached us in Scarborough at the Softball Nationals. And uh, Labette was sponsoring us at the time, so a bunch of the guys went out and they, they had a, we had a van rented. And uh, they all came back. There was 12 of them came back, and a few of us stayed upstairs. And uh, we heard this shouting and roaring from, from our room in the direction of the elevator and uh, went out to see what, what the problem was. And uh, they were all stuck in the elevator. And as it happened, as it turned out, the reason they were stuck, because there was a big sign in the elevator saying maximum nine people. And... Uh, Twelve of them got on the elevator twenty dozen beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Colin, I'm sure you have another one for us. Well, again, it involves the coaching aspect. I guess it's the coaches you always sort of pick on or remember what happened to. 
at these occasions. But uh, another year was when demurphy coached us. And uh, we're not really sure about Dee's driving. And he hadn't had his license long at that point either, so that made us even more wary. I don't know if Dee is even sure about his driving, is he? I'm not sure. He came home one night and said, oh, he just had a, a hit-and-run accident on Water Street. And we were, he'd only had his license about six months up to this point, but we were sort of like, what did you do? So he told us after he hit a garbage can and took off. But he did, as it happened, hit the garbage can, so it's out of dent in the car. But uh, two summers later, in, we were in Quebec at the time for the Nationals. And we had a van rented again. And we were all coming back from the game, sitting in the van. And there was a, a porch, like, overhang at the entrance of the uh, hotel. So D, being perfect specimen of a man, decided he was going to drive all the ladies right to the door and uh, hadn't noticed the clearance room up above. So uh, he goes and drives on through, and the next thing, the roof on the van caved in. D never bat an eyelash at all, just sat there and assessed the situation, and after a while just poked it up the park. Park the van, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> Park the van, Meg, David, sure, sure. Well, Colleen, thanks for joining us on our Sports Personality Christmas Special, and certainly a pleasure talking to you again. Thank you, and a very Merry Christmas to you. Thanks, Sally. You know, when somebody talks about, about Dee Murphy's ability to drive, I assume now that they can manipulate the, the byways and the highways of this province as well as anybody else, but uh, as Colleen says, in these earlier ways of, in days of driving, let me tell you that... Uh, People used to say, Dee, where are you going tonight? And uh, Dee would say, why? And they'd say, why? Because I'm going the other way. He was a, a menace on the road. He couldn't back up, and he just went straight on. Of course, everybody knew Dee, and then everybody got out of his way. Mm -hmm. Of course, our uh, next uh, athlete, uh, no stranger, uh, Dewey and uh, Vince Withers. And, of course, Vince stands tall in any sport. Well, when you're about six foot four, you have to, regardless of your ability, I guess, you have to stand tall. But uh, a lot of people look at Vince Withers as a, as a, a tremendous administrator, and uh, that's exactly what he is now, you know. But uh, Vince was uh, an all-star softball player in his playing days, uh, one of the city's better bowlers, and uh, then when he, he moved up the ladder in the, in the business field, he, he put time back into sport as an administrator. He's after playing host to not only softball national championships, but uh, curling national championships as well. He was on those committees, and uh, coming up this summer, Vince is uh, again back as chairman for the all-important 1988 uh, ladies' national championships, and uh, it's certainly nice to have uh, Vince Withers with us tonight. Vince, welcome aboard, boy. Thank you. How are you doing, Vince? Of course, after such a great career, I'm sure that you have some funny stories for us, a couple of funny stories for us tonight. I like the funniest one here, this being referred to as an athlete. <laughs> I've been referred to a lot of things in the past, <laughs> but not an athlete. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have uh, a couple of uh, stories. One involves D, and everybody seems to have a story about D, but that's because there are a lot of stories about D, and one about Dewey. And, and uh, I, this, this story about D happened uh, a long time ago. It involved uh, D and Pee Wee Crane, who have since died. And it happened in, in Gander. Gander was hosting, uh, I, I believe, either a senior A or senior B tournament. And uh, Argentia in those days were very prominent in softball. When they sent their team to Gander, they flew their team in and they sent along to Brass, the commander, the whole works. We had a hospitality room in, in the hotel, as we always did. The uh, always uh, one in style. <laughs> We invited the base commander who came in full uniform with all the medals and all the ribbons and everything that you'd see on a base commander because they were very high in sport and they always sent along their, their top officials. So we invited him up. I did, Rich Coggy. We thought it would be a nice thing to invite uh, the base commander up to our hospitality room. And little did we realize, of course, that uh, there was going to be a surprise there for him. We had uh, arranged a, a crib for Pee Wee Crane. Pee Wee was in the crib. We had a three-piece band who happened to be driving across the province, heading for the stadium, and we uh, interrupted their uh, driving to, to bring them into our hospitality room. So in came the base commander, and Dee, uh, or, yeah, Dee at the time was taking a shower. And Dee comes out of the shower, of course, naked, walks over to this very prim and proper base commander who 
who, uh, you know, is, as I said, dressed, uh, dressed for her, puts his arm around this guy and plants a big kiss on the side of his cheek. <laughs> And, and to visualize a, a baby's crib in the corner with Pee Wee Crane and this, these three weird guys playing music. Anyway, we locked Dee out in the hall, naked. Dee was gone for the longest time, a half an hour. He came back later on with clothes on. We never did find out where he got the clothes or what happened to him. But he had an awful contented smile on his face. <laughs> uh, that was a pretty funny story if you had to see the, the setting. Uh, I'm sure it was, <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, uh, Dewey, you'd, you'd have, you know the character, so you know what that means. The second one involved Dewey, and, and uh, Dewey and, and Dee, of course, are two characters, so they're two of the best stories that I can remember. De before the, uh, the, national, um, the, the national championships had representatives from all the province, uh, Eastern Canada, Atlantic Canada, would have a regional playoff. This was before the 11-team the type of thing, and... Uh, We'd play off uh, between uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, and, and Newfoundland. And fortunately, we had it hosted here one year. This goes back a long ways. And uh, Dewey was umpire in chief behind the plate. And you'd have to know Dewey and his umpiring to appreciate this story. I was on first base. And New Brunswick had the biggest softball team I've seen around in terms of size. Uh, and of course, Dewey, uh, being a colorful umpire, decided halfway through the game that several of those players were going to be thrown out of the game. And he started to throw players out of the game. Once he threw one, it ended up being six. And the funny part about it, of course, is I was the one that was delegated to throw these players out of the game. So Dewey would say to me, out of the game, you, get him out of the game. So we threw six out. Uh, a, a small ride happened that particular day. I don't know if this is humorous or not, but it's a, a real story. After the game was over, of course, uh, New Brunswick, uh, who happened uh, to uh, play St. John's in the final game, sent this small note along to the organizer saying that if Dewey Fitzgerald umpired that last game, Dewey, I'm not sure what words they used, but they weren't kind words. Uh, so Dewey uh, didn't umpire the game. He went way up in the park, up by the, the swimming pool today in Bannerman Park, and I umpired the last game. And St. John's lost one to nothing. And I believe to this very day, do if you had to umpire that game, they would have won more than I. That's good. That's a good story. Well, Vince, thanks for joining us on our sports personality Christmas show. It's always yeah. a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Vince. And of course, do we? Um, last but not least, we have a gentleman joining us on the set now, and of course, it's none other than Don Johnson. And what can we say about Don Johnson that already hasn't been said? Donald S. Johnson. Don, what's the S for, Don? Stewart. Stewart. That's a nice, nice name. Family name. Yes. Of course, Don, recently, I guess we should congratulate him. Uh, uh, I think it's common knowledge, at least it was in, in the print media. And, of course, Don is a host of one of your cable shows as well. Uh, has just been appointed chairman of the Canada Games Fire Commission. And uh, that's uh, another position. And uh, there's the many ones that he's held. But I think... Uh, his primary one, of course, was president of the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association, and, and uh, in that position he, he travelled all around the world and uh, saw some of the, the best hockey players in the world, uh, knew a lot of them personally, and uh, a lot of stories that you can tell about Dan, I suppose, and Dan can tell a barrel of them, but before Dan tells you one, I'll tell you one about Dan. Uh, yeah, you, you have to, to know Dan's good wife, Florence, to appreciate this, because while at times, Don is boisterous and hearty and laughing. Florence is a very, very mild lady, and uh, at most times has to has to be spoken to. She's she's a very, very shy person. But anyway, they were down in uh, Bermuda at the National Hockey League uh, Association meetings, and of course, Don, being a, a good friend of Alan Eagleson, they were sitting there one day having uh, having breakfast with Alan Eagleson and and, and Bobby Orr, Don and his wife, and and. Uh, Apparently, uh, after they were chatting for a while, uh, Mrs. Johnson said to Mr. Orr, she said, what type of business are you in? <laughs> and of course, at that time, Bobby Orr was a household name, the best hockey player in the world. Mm -hmm. Dan, nice to have you, boy. Nice of you to invite me, do we? I appreciate that, you and Ted. That's very kind of you. Well, Don, you've been here in Newfoundland now quite a while, and I'm sure, of course, all your involvement with sports down through the years, and I'm sure there's a couple of funny stories that you can tell us for our 
sports personality Christmas humorous special? Well, there's a few. Uh, I, <laughs> this is Christmas season. I don't want to upset Archbishop Skinner, but uh, <laughs> one of the cutest ones. It's Penny now. <laughs> no, no, but this, uh, no, this is our Bishop Skinner was okay. the bishop when this happened. But uh, as you know, I played on that team with uh, some Pats that won the ball trophy in 1960. God forgive <laughs> I don't think God's forgiven us yet. But uh, Neil Amadio and Alf and uh, those that, and Brother Nash that ran the Petition Association, uh, got really concerned that some bonds could put five super players on the ice whenever we got a penalty. And, uh, but yet the like of myself and Dick Power and Joe Kenny and that, we couldn't seem to stay out of the penalty box. And they used to preach and preach and preach at us, you know. Play good uh, hockey, play clean hockey and stay out of the penalty box because every time we get a penalty, you know, some bonds could put on Billy and Teddy Gillis and Bobby Redman and and uh, other people like that, and really had a good power play. But not anything they said didn't have any, any effect on us. So we were playing that famous series, and after the third game, uh, it was getting ready for the fourth game, Alf Connors came storming in the dressing room. And boy, you knew when Alf was mad. And he said, now you've done it. He said, I've been preaching at you all winter, particularly in the playoffs, and now you've done it. You've absolutely done it. And he said, I don't want to hear a peep in this dressing room. And boy, he read a telegram that he had received from Archbishop Skinner about our conduct as young Christian gentlemen and how we were behaving on the ice and that we were uh, next to a disgrace to the church and uh, that if we didn't start, you know, playing hockey like true Christian gentlemen would play, he would have no alternative uh, but to cancel the series in the best interest of the church. You know, yours in Christ, P.J. Skinner, Archbishop of St. John's. Well, boy, there was just a hush over the dressing room. Nobody said a word for about three or four minutes. Here was uh, a scolding from the bishop. Anyway, I'll tell you, I, I didn't get any more penalties, and I don't, you know, it was almost like under penalty of going to hell. And uh, so that was fair enough. We ended up not getting any more, very few penalties after that, and won the series. The funny part about it is, Charlie Walsh was married about 10 years after. And of course, Alf Connors was one of the speakers, one of the toasters. And he said, boys, most of the team is here. And he said, my conscience has bothered me ever since you've won the series. He said, I think it's about time you fellas knew that, that I sent that telegram to myself, he said, Archbishop Skinner didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don Johnson, we sure would like to thank you for joining us on our Christmas sports personalities, and again, always a pleasure to talk to you, Don. Yeah, and Merry Christmas to you, Ted and Dewey, uh, two good friends, and thank I'm you and your nice family, to Don. share it with you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Ted. Well, Dewey, that about wraps up our guest list that we had, but uh, <clears throat> everybody else came on and told some funny story about their sports career or some incident that happened. Uh, you remember two years ago on our Christmas special, we went around to about four or five different locations around the St. John's area. And uh, what we did that day, we did intros to different segments. And of course, Dewey and I made some bloopers and uh, we had a lot of fun that day. So we decided to keep those bloopers and we did show them two years ago, but we're gonna show them again tonight. Seeing the show involves a humorous side of sport. So right now, we're going to go to what we call the sports personalities bloopers. What do you say, Dewey? Ted, boy, I saw before, and it uh, looks pretty easy to go with bloopers. Good evening, and welcome to our Christmas sports special. I'm Ted Patey, and my co-host, Dewey Fitzgerald. We'll be taking a look back at the year 1985. Uh, do it again. <laughs> Sport knowledgeable people, and uh, I'm sure as the evening goes on, they'll enjoy looking back at it. So no. Oh, cut, cut. <laughs> you took the murder. <laughs> and welcome to our Christmas sports special. 
I'm Ted Petey, and my host, no, do it again, Sean. 1985, we saw, or we had, caught, <laughs> hey, Rob, <laughs> ready? Yeah. 1985, Dewey, uh, we had, no, <laughs> we can't go laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good laugh. Yeah. Shoot it again. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take it. Let me take her in. And you are so easy. Go ahead, Ali. You're fine, Dewey. Ted, in 1985, you had some tremendous sports specials. You had the golden years of baseball, the golden years of softball, 50th anniversary of the Newfoundland Tennis Association, a great historic event, which was the 50th anniversary of the Herder. The Herder Memorial. NHA Club. Hockey. And we also had. What? What was the other one? We had a herder, we had tennis, and we know? had softball. Then we did the special on the golden years of baseball and the golden years right, of softball. Go ahead, take or take. Go ahead, ready, Sean? Please up, we've worked for a nice people with that. Yeah. We're going to be here a while. Go for it. Dewey, 1985, we shot a special on the 50th anniversary of the herder. <laughs> What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Just a moment. Get your hand in the horse. Get your hand in the horse. John. Now, take it out of your system, boy. Come on. Give them calls. Get her going. Uh, yeah, see? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a shot here. Now, it's oh, okay. serious now, John. Mm. Okay, go ahead. That's right with the man. Forget it. Wait, shut her out, Sean, for a minute. Don't hit, man. Watch this when it's edited. This is in prime material to go in, nothing is. <laughs> Take three, Golden Boys. During 1985, we saw the 50th anniversary of the Herder Memorial Trophy. We also had the 20th. What do you have to say, Mr. Fitzgerald? I just think it was. I think it was. I'm going so good. Don't let him run. You're out. Don't mind me, neighbor. We're into the Christmas party. We are outside. Come on now. Anytime, good. Anytime, good. Well, Dewey, that's our show. We have about 30 seconds to kill, and uh, it was really enjoyable for our fourth annual Christmas sports special. And uh, I want to thank you again for being my co host tonight, and certainly did a great job as usual. Well, Ted, we had uh, quite an array of. Uh, Ladies Talent. and gentlemen with us, I suppose, talents of all sports, and uh, I enjoyed being with them and being enjoyed with you, and uh, I wish you and your family a Merry Christmas, and uh, I hope we'll be back again next year, please God. And same to you, Dewey. So that wraps up our fourth annual Christmas sports special for this year, 1987, and we shall see you in the new year. Have a good Christmas.